Hoy día tenemos a la profesora Rachel Yegi de la Universidad Humboldt de Berlín, con la que vamos a conversar sobre la crisis y la crítica al capitalismo. Eh, Rachel, hasta hace muy pocos años, tanto en el mundo académico como en el ámbito de la opinión pública, hablar de capitalismo, o siquiera mencionar la palabra capitalismo, era interpretado como una especie de añoranza anacrónica, como una sospechosa defensa de que otro orden económico era posible o necesario. En, en un contexto, además, en el que toda alternativa al libre mercado había mostrado ya su fracaso para la mayoría. Capitalismo, como tú misma recuerdas en tu diálogo con Nancy Fraser, tenía hasta hace poco una connotación peyorativa que muy pocos estaban dispuestos a tolerar. El hecho de que esta situación hoy en día esté cambiando y no sea raro ver libros, proyectos de investigación, congresos, que exhiben con orgullo en sus títulos no solamente la palabra capitalismo, sino que además combinan la palabra capitalismo con términos como crítica, crisis, término o hundimiento, me lleva a plantearte algunas preguntas. Tú has dedicado buena parte de tu obra a analizar el modo en que las propias formas de vida generan bloqueos que impiden a los individuos percibir cuándo estas formas de vida están en crisis. Es decir, estos bloqueos no solo dificultan solucionar problemas, sino sobre todo percibir que alguna institución, práctica o norma es problemática. ¿Dirías que es eso lo que ha ocurrido también en el caso del capitalismo como forma de vida?, y que ahora muchos de los bloqueos que impedían estudiarlo críticamente están siendo eliminados? Yeah, thank you for those questions, which are actually more than one question. <laughs> so I'm going to ask my uh, certain other uh, reply one after the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're absolutely right. I think there is the critique of capitalism somehow has a, even a boom period of late. I mean, this has been going on for Uh, quite some years now, um, whereas capitalism as a concept and also as a research topic has been absent even from critical theory for um, quite some years, which had to do with the shortcomings of some kind of a dogmatic uh, critique of capitalism, but also with some, I mean, inner academic and other um, situations, also with the fact that a lot of other problems have come up that on first sight didn't have or couldn't be traced back to capitalism as such. So I think there is now a situation in which we can try and do try to somehow reintegrate all those different issues. I mean, uh, concerning race, class, gender, the ecological crisis and so on. And for, for quite a while, those issues have been treated separately for quite a while. They have not been um, pursued as a problem of the social and economical order. And now there might be the time to somehow come up with the, this. I mean, trying to, critical theorists are now trying to draw those connections without falling back into the kind of totalizing uh, concept of capitalism. And also we should actually avoid to fall back into the kind of deterministic, economism. So what we try to do now is to deal with capitalism as more than just the economical order, uh, but with capitalism as, as I would say, a form of life that um, encompasses social practices, economic practices, political uh, practices, cultural practices. So it's, it's like capitalism and its influence on or in the way that uh, economic practices um, are related to everything else and um, in, in, in the way that capitalism is a problem not only or has its dysfunctions not only in the strictly economical sense but also i mean talking about why is capitalism back uh, on the picture Of course, this has a lot to do with the kind of instability and the obvious dysfunctionalities that people have been experiencing in the last um, uh, decades. The kind of, I mean, economic crisis, financial, uh, the financial crisis, um, the instability of the economic and the social order, and then the connections between 
all those sorts, all those injustices or uh, dimensions of exploitations that have become more and more visible. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, as, 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 you, as, you, as you clearly pointed out, the, the, the situation. Um, now, does capitalism uh, suffer from blockages or from the kind of learning blockages or experiential blockages that uh, I've been talking about in, in my Forms of Life book? <clears throat> Is capitalism, I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would put it this way, capitalism is caught up in a dynamic that obviously does not go so well or has uh, prevents learning uh, in, a, uh, in a certain sense. There are some very dramatic indicators for this. Uh, the obvious ones like climate catastrophe, an issue that has uh, come up, I mean, decades ago, and has uh, and and now we are in the situation where everything i mean everyone is somehow alarmed uh, even uh, 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 some of our institutions are reacting or try to uh, or pretend to react to the situation there are uh, the growing inequalities there are the authoritarian moments that uh, if you um, thematize how democracy and capitalism uh, whether democracy and capitalism have some kind of an inner, inner tension that uh, uh, makes it likely at a, cer a certain situation to turn into the kind of authoritarianism that uh, is developing all over the world. So, I mean, there are, I mean, one problem, I mean, a lot of problems, a lot of uh, uh, obvious crises and a lot of, uh, and I mean, one general feature that um, our capitalist form, form of life seems to live and eat up resources that it cannot provide it as with, I mean, on the social level, on the ecological level, uh, and so on. Um, and the experience of a lot, a lot of people is that there is no way uh, that those experiences and those crises find its way into democratic decision-making, which would be one of the preconditions for a democratic learning process. And a lot of people have, uh, I mean, suffer from the experience that their own social experience is not finding its way into the public debate at all, that they are excluded, not by, I mean, not, not in, in an obvious uh, manner uh, necessarily, but uh, somehow the political and, and, and the, the democratic institutions um, don't allow for those experiences and for those moments of uh, suffering, being excluded, being dominated uh, to um, show even up in the public sphere, which then brings me to the kind of, uh, I mean, to the concept of learning blockage or an experiential blockage here. Maybe I should clarify because you, you were asking me uh, whether those blockages prevent us from studying uh, the shortcomings uh, and the crisis of, of uh, capitalism. Maybe it's it's uh, it's worth and 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 necessary to um, to clarify something about the idea of the learning process or the respective blockage. Because it, I mean, the way um, you put it is a bit too, I would say, too cognitivistic and too. Um, um, Maybe also too individualistic because you, I mean, so I mean I would say there are three moments that are important here. One is that the learning blockages I'm talking about are meant to be a collective, a genuinely like social phenomenon. It's not just individuals who are prevented from experiencing and learning something. It is. A social order it's collectives it's a form of life that is somehow structurally built such uh, that a certain kind of experiences are uh, uh, are excluded or that they can't react to uh, to crisis and problems uh, in, a, in a proper way so this is not contingent but also located on a structural level it's located on the level of collective experience and also addresses the possibility um, of turning collective experiences into some kind of action. Uh, the second point is that I'm not talking about a cognitive process or insight alone, but something that is located on 
I mean, sometimes it is something like a missing vocabulary or a missing concept mm -hmm. that somehow prevents us from making sense of our social world. But even this has a more like practical dimension, something like it affects the social institutions and practices and the way that individuals, embodied individuals, make sense of their world. And is so the learning process, maybe learning process is not even the, uh, the right word, Erfahrungsprozess, uh, experiential process, something that is a bit more like conclusive and uh, uh, um, and addresses the way that practices make sense and enable us to experience um, our world. And then the third um, uh, feature I, I wanted to mention is that I'm talking about processes. So it's not just about so there's a temporal dimension in the idea of a learning process and uh, a blockage of the learning uh, process. So whether there's a blockage or not um, can be um, seen just, I mean, in terms of a static hidden truth that we are prevented from seeing because there's some kind of, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's somehow blocked or covered up or something. It's, it's about... Um, so the question is whether we are um, able to learn from previous experience from, or whether we are able to, to address problems on the level on which they occurred. So the whole project somehow is about the dynamics of social change, about the dynamics, something like um, how does a certain um, form of life, how does a social order react to experiences and how is it, uh, what are the resources for the adequate kind of reaction uh, to crisis? And of course, in the background, there's the idea that uh, social dynamics are always somehow addressing crisis or that crisis is the moment that somehow brings forward the dynamics of social change and transformation. And then the question is, is this the right kind of transformation? Is the kind of transformation that is needed uh, in place? Volviendo al tema del capitalismo como forma de vida y a sus bloqueos, lo que has hablado al final, ¿cómo puede entenderse a la ideología en relación a la imposibilidad de que un individuo o una sociedad perciba algo como un problema? Y quiero decir, si bien no siempre se ve con claridad el problema detrás de una situación dada, tal problema entre comillas casi, sí suele expresarse a través de los efectos negativos que generan las personas. Por ejemplo, en la forma de malestares más o menos identificables, depresión, desorientación social, pérdida de sentido de la vida, etc. Sin embargo, la forma de vida capitalista históricamente se ha especializado en disminuir, aminorar cada vez más estos malestares. Ha llegado al punto de que ya no tiene que convencer o manipular a nadie sino que realmente crea felicidad y satisfacción en las personas. En este contexto, ¿la categoría de ideología puede decirnos algo todavía? Um, I don't know. I mean, in some way, this seems to be a scenario from the golden 70s or 60s, uh, maybe earlier. So some, somehow a Fordist scenario, the kind of situation that critical theory has bothered at a certain stage. I mean, this, this idea, what are we, I mean, how can we criticize the social order if obviously it has a lot of resources to make people happy or to then as uh, the, the first generation would have said, I mean, pretend to make uh, uh, people happy by creating uh, needs that it then can fulfill. Um, I would say, Right now, we are in a situation where the capitalist form of life has created quite some discomfort. I mean, it's not no longer the situation that everything seems to be fine. The, I mean, somehow the masses are pacified with, I mean, by fulfilling all their needs and by creating some kind of uh, uh, artificial kind of happiness. Uh, a lot of discomfort, precarity, the global exploitation, climate change, I mean, all these uh, things that we mentioned and, and the sense of instability and of, I mean, precariousness, not just in an economical sense, but I mean, on the level of, of their whole 
the whole existence. But apart from this, I mean, the, the underlying question is what role does ideology play at all? Are there, I mean, is the social order even possible without some kind of legitimizing narrative, which is what, I mean, part of what an ideology is, is it, it's, it's a legitimizing narrative. It's a narrative that, that somehow um, um, provides members of social order to, with concepts and legitimation and a narrative to make sense of uh, what's going on in the social order. And then, of course, it's the kind of, of a narrative, and this is why it's an ideology, um, that um, is at least, at least part of or is, is partly responsible for a situation in which individuals would somehow collaborate or somehow not go against a social order, social institutions that exploit them, make them unhappy, dominate them, uh, whatever. So ideologies, I mean, at least in a first, maybe uh, all too trivial sense are, um, are narratives that help those who dominate, I mean, the, I mean help, um, sorry, there's, there's too much noise in the background, uh, that, that, that are responsible for a situation in which people won't even be able to, um, um, to identify their own interests in order to, yeah, wouldn't be able, wouldn't even be able to identify their own interests. I would say there is no social order that can go without su such a narrative. And I would say that uh, in neoliberalism, for example, um, even if, if, if people have said the neoliberal situation obviously doesn't need ideologies anymore, it's just, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it works in a different way. I would say that um, neoliberals, ideology or the legitimizing and also motivating a narrative is something like, let's say, creativity, autonomy, um, responsibility, the ideology of responsibility that, uh, that somehow binds people to the social order, um, um, puts them in a situation where they seem to be responsible for their own uh, fate where at, th at the same time, of course, I mean, this is actually an ideology because they are uh, uh, dominated by, by social dynamics that they, they couldn't do anything about. Um, and as always with ideologies, I think it's an important uh, thing to locate ideologies on the level of uh, a social order and the structural question how a social order is able to reproduce itself so ideologies are not not just some kind of biases or some kind of um bad habits that prevent us from not being racist and, and so on ideologies are, have, a, have a stronger impact and a stronger constitutive function within the social order as within let's say early capitalism the idea of, of freedom and equality had a constitutive function within uh, a social order, and also um, it, it's, it's also also important to to realize that ideologies are not just some kind of cover-up story or some kind of uh, it's not not just fake. It's something that grasps an element of the social order very well. I mean, as with respect to capitalism, uh, the freedom of contract and the idea that. Um, it is through contract that we enter the labor market and our are equals, I mean, are free and equal as persons who enter this labor contract is actually part of the institutional structure of a capitalist um, social order. At the same time, it's ideolo ideological because it doesn't uh, live up to the idea of freedom and equality and it even has some um, some, I mean, there are contradictions involved in the shortcomings of this. Uh, these ideas not uh, not being realized in the, in the very social order that is constituted by them. And I think the same thing is going on with uh, these, let's say, new interpretations of freedom and equality, the kind of pluralism, creativity, autonomy, responsibility, uh, all those values that, at the same time, um, are actually. 
I mean, we can see that a neoliberal economic and cultural and social order is different from like early capitalism or classic capitalism, that flexibility plays in, uh, plays an important role that a certain kind of individualism of course is uh, uh, has been triggered by uh, by the social order and so on and so on at the same time the very social order that um, uh, builds uh, upon individualism and creativity um, prevents people from you know, leading a life that uh, uh, would live up to the idea of self-realization that at the same time is promoted by those uh, narratives. So yes, I would say there, I mean, there's always ideology. Um, uh, I mean, in, no, there's always a legit, legitimizing narrative, uh, narrative uh, and as long as we are in a, let's say, broadly irrational and just social order, those narratives will also be ideological and ideolo ide ideology will be part of uh, the story of, 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 of domination and an irrational social order. Yeah, that's the answer to, <laughs> to your question. Is it, um, uh, does it still tell us something in this context? Uh, I'm pretty sure that we have to that we are dealing with both, I mean, a normative crisis and a functional crisis of the institutions in question. And part of the normative crisis, or in order to get, get closer, get a grasp on the normative crisis, uh, we have to be, we have to do ideology critique. Estamos pasando, sin duda, ya que has tocado el tema de las crisis, estamos pasando por una crisis que en muchos países ha servido eh, paradójicamente o afortunadamente para revelar la existencia de otras muchas crisis que ya estaban presentes pero que eran poco visibles usando la útil y, y en el momento ya muy difundida distinción entre distintos órdenes de problemas podríamos decir que la crisis del COVID-19 nos ha mostrado los peligros de una excesiva desregulación de los mercados y la exagerada mercantilización de todos los bienes eh, sin hacer distinciones entre bienes necesarios y bienes de lujo. Por ejemplo, la educación, lo estamos viendo, y la salud entran al mercado para ser producidos y distribuidos con las mismas reglas con las cuales se produce y distribuyen automóviles y ropa de marca o cualquier otro bien de consumo. ¿Consideras que esta crisis actual está sirviendo de alguna manera, para romper con algunos de los bloqueos a los que antes te referiste, o en todo caso, ¿hay en el modo de percibir esta crisis de segundo orden algún elemento de análisis epistémico que pueda servir para explicar qué es lo que se requiere para problematizar algo en general? Yeah, so I mean, I actually do think that the corona crisis does reveal something and also uh, creates a certain, uh, let's say, a certain space or a space, I mean, a window of opportunities for uh, social transformations to happen. But the problem, as always with this uh, space, is it might be possible now to, <laughs> to act on what has been revealed here, but also... Uh, It's, it's very, I mean, you never know in which direction those uh, changes will go. So I'm not, not utterly optimistic about it. Um, I do think that um, the corona pandemic is a crisis as, a, I mean, crisis from within as well as just a crisis from outside. So there has been a debate going on about whether it's just a, like random natural disaster, bad luck, so to say, which then would mean it is a crisis. It certainly is a global crisis, but it's not a social crisis or a kind of, I mean, it's not a crisis of the, of our form of life, of the capitalist form of life or whatever, because it's not somehow not self-made. And I think that uh, the, the concept of, and the idea of a second order crisis or second order problems actually helps to understand what's going on here. Um, because Um, I mean, in, in, in some, se some sense, it doesn't matter whether Corona has just, is just a contingent natural disaster or not. The interesting and, and, and the important question is whether 
our societies have the resources to act on it or to um, to go through the process that is needed in order to uh, to even and here we are back to learning processes to even understand what kind of structural uh, deficits are at work that prevent us from reacting to the crisis in a proper way and when we um i think if i mean comparing the situation in different countries of course also reveals that there are um, depending on what kind of resources, material resources, what kind in, in which stage the welfare system, <laughs> of, of, uh, for example, is. But of, but of course, also, I mean, as as you uh, um, you you see in Brazil and in the United States, uh, what kind of political regime is reacting to the crisis. So it's obvious that here we have the same kind of natural disaster, and then I mean, a whole sort of different ways to react to it uh, that reveal some of the structural problems so first and second order crisis i mean in my in my terms um first order order problems are a first order uh, a crisis is a crisis from the outside like a natural disaster that is not created by the form of life itself uh, that is not uh, an uh, um, an outcome of of the of the way the society itself, the social order itself is organized. And then a second order problem or crisis would be exactly that, uh, that those problems have been created by the structure uh, in question, that it's an imminent uh, 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 crisis that is um, a result of inner contradictions or tensions that couldn't be solved or a lack of a certain kind of resources. Um, so, the second order crisis is um, located on the level where society lacks resources, like our society, some of our societies with respect to, uh, to Corona, the first order crisis somehow hits in. Um, in the end, it doesn't matter whether we have created the, I mean, there is also a, uh, an extensive debate about how we have created the corona crisis the corona uh, problem in the first place but in the end it doesn't doesn't even matter because uh, the what is important for us is whether our social institutions have uh, the resources to live up to uh, to those problems to thematize them to uh, to draw um, consequences like I mean, even even Macron at some point said, "Oh, maybe uh, health shouldn't be uh, a purely economical issue. Maybe this, maybe public goods are something that should be treated differently from, I mean, uh, 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 from from commodities and, and 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 economic goods of a certain kind." So you could see that there is what I, with respect to the dynamics of social change, what I would call, I mean, the crack, the opening that uh, the crisis moment where somehow reality <laughs> gets in and disrupts the social order at the same time again it's not so clear what what's what's going to happen which then also leads to a second question or to, to a second problem that has has been thematized in, in critical theory a lot namely the uh, relation between crisis and social conflict crisis and social struggles. I would say they're always, I mean, these are two sides of the same coin and it's very important to keep them together and to realize that uh, whether we we, um, we are able to, um, wh whether there will be an em emancipatory social transformation is something that has to do with both, with the crisis and with the ability of social movements to to act on the crisis or to turn the crisis into a conflict. So both is true. It's not just, uh, I mean, I, I think we should go against the kind of voluntarism that would say it's just like the will and the courage of social actors who can bring about social transformation. This is true to a certain extent, but again <laughs> uh, has to be related to the other side of the coin which which is uh, there there are deep structural dysfunctionalities and crises uh, that um, the circumstances that we need in order to 
uh, to act on act on it and turn a crisis into a conflict um, bringing together both so bringing together what Marx then called the passive and the active element uh, of a revolution is something that is needed in order to not to be too um, I mean also to I, I, would, I would say it's also an important uh, I mean to to um, uh, to keep in play both the crisis, the objective elements and the subjective elements, the preconditions for social movements and social conflicts and, and, and the other side that of course at a certain moment and, you, and it, it, it was really impressive to observe how the Black Lives Matter movement somehow, and again it's, it is a movement that had, I mean all those dimensions like you had the corona crisis, you had the ongoing uh, um, um, suppression. You had the ongoing problem, uh, but at a certain point, it was it was possible to create this very moment that is always so astonishing with respect to uh, when when a real social movement and something that is able to trans uh, transform uh, something all of a sudden shows up. You, I mean, we are always a bit like surprised. I mean, the power of this movement. Uh, has come as a, as a surprise, as with a lot of movements. Movements at the same time, uh, thinking about it, you see that, that there are all those elements, of constellation that had to come together in order to to make this movement uh, work. Which also means that the element of crisis and the question of whether a social movement, a certain kind of social conflict, is an adequate reaction to the underlying crisis, provides us with a powerful criterion. I would say. Uh, in order to judge upon those conflicts and those uh, and the way that the social movements themselves are a learning process or learn from the experiences that they are able to articulate and the moments that they are able to uh, to create in order to make social change possible. Rachel, muchísimas gracias por tu participación en esas entrevistas. Y nada, espero que nos veamos pronto nuevamente. Gracias. 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 <laughs>